From New York, this is Democracy Now! This is a toxic environment. The international community has to speak with one voice in rejecting this extremism, in rejecting those terrorists and those elements of fascist in the Israeli government. The United Nations Security Council is preparing to hold an emergency meeting just days after Israel's new far-right national security minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir, visited the Al-Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem, sparking outrage across the Middle East. We'll look at what Benjamin Netanyahu's new far-right government means for the future of Palestine with Palestinian attorney Diana Bhutto and in Ramallah and Israeli journalist Gidon Levy in Tel Aviv, then to the chaos in the U.S. House of Representatives. No member-elect having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast, a speaker has not been elected. The House of Representatives remains without a House speaker as far-right Republicans continue to block Republican Kevin McCarthy's attempts to become speaker. McCarthy has lost six rounds of voting so far. How long will the standstill last? We'll speak with Representative-elect Greg Kassar of Texas. He, like all 435 members of the House, cannot be sworn in until a speaker is elected. We'll also talk to The Intercept's Ryan Grimm. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The House of Representatives has adjourned for a second consecutive day without swearing in members of the 118th Congress, after lawmakers once again failed to elect a new House Speaker. On Wednesday, the House held three more rounds of voting. In each one, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy failed to muster the 218 votes needed after 20 members of his party instead backed Byron Donalds of Florida. Until a speaker is elected, the House cannot perform any other actions or swear in any Congress member. Mississippi Congress member Trent Kelly joined other Republicans calling on members of his party's far-right Freedom Caucus to drop their opposition to McCarthy. But we've asked and we've asked, what is it you want? What do you need? But you have 20 people demanding the unconditional surrender of including this group of warriors. We will not unconditionally surrender. Tell us what you want. We might surrender if you tell us the terms. But just so you know, we're in the strong position. There's 201 of us and 20 of them. After headlines, we'll go to Capitol Hill for the latest, with Representative-elect Greg Kassar of Texas, who's still waiting to be sworn in, as well as every other Congress member. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of emergency and ordered evacuations as a cyclone slammed into the San Francisco Bay Area Wednesday night with hurricane-force winds and torrential downpours. California's second major storm this week is expected to wreak havoc across the state, including flooding, landslides and dangerous winds. A young child was killed in Sonoma County when a tree fell on the family home. Over 180 80,000 customers had lost power by early this morning. This is a resident of Santa Cruz County in Northern California. We get home last night, and first thing we did was pack our stuff off the floor and, you know, all the important stuff, gather it, you know, get some uh, luggage ready just in case, and get some uh, sandbags to for, for the possible evacuation. California has been experiencing a series of extreme weather events known as atmospheric rivers, which have been described as rivers in the sky, unleashing unrelenting storms. Scientists say climate change will continue to increase the intensity of these storms. In the occupied West Bank, Israeli forces have shot and killed a Palestinian teenager during a raid on the city of Nablus. The Palestinian Health Ministry reports 16-year-old Amr Abu Zetoun was the fourth Palestinian child killed by Israeli forces since the start of the new year. Elsewhere, Israel's military has begun demolishing homes, water supplies and olive orchards in Musafa Yatta, in the occupied West Bank, near Hebron. This week, Israeli armored vehicles accompanied 
company demolition crews as they razed homes and farms in two villages. Last year, the Israeli High Court of Justice approved the home demolitions, which will uproot more than 1,000 people. In Washington, D.C., Palestinian-American U.S. Congress member Rashida Tlaib tweeted, not even one week into 2023, Israel's new far-right apartheid government is moving to ethnically cleanse entire communities, which would displace more than 1,000 Palestinian residents, including 500 children, all with American backing bulldozers and bullets, she tweeted. The Anglican Church has expressed dismay over an attack on a Christian cemetery close to Jerusalem's walled old city. Security camera footage taken on New Year's Day shows two men entering the graveyard, toppling a cross-shaped tombstone, smashing it to pieces. More than 30 grave sites were damaged. Jerusalem's Anglican Archbishop called the desecration a clear hate crime carried out by quote, Jewish extremists. The incident came days after Israel swore in the most far-right government in its history, led by ultra-religious and ultra-nationalist members. Palestinian Ambassador Riyad Mansour addressed the incident at the United Nations Wednesday. You've seen by now that there are crosses over, you know, graveyards being trampled upon and attacked by extreme settlers. This is a toxic environment. The international community has to speak with one voice in rejecting this extremism, in rejecting those terrorists and those elements of fascists in the Israeli government. The U.N. Security Council has scheduled an emergency meeting at the request of the U.N.'s Palestinian delegation after Israel's new national security minister, the ultra-nationalist politician Itamar Ben-Gavir, visited the Al-Aqsa Mosque and occupied East Jerusalem. In Washington, D.C., U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price was critical of Ben-Gavir's visit, which other nations have condemned as a provocative act. Uh, we stand firmly for preservation of the historic status quo with respect to the holy sites in Jerusalem. Any unilateral actions that depart from that historic status quo is uh, unacceptable. Back in the United States, newly released documents reveal the Pentagon's top general had to dissuade senior Trump administration officials from attempting to court-martial retired military officers who wrote editorials critical of Donald Trump. That's one of dozens of new revelations from testimony by Joint Chiefs Chair General Mike Mark Milley to the House January 6 Committee, made public this week in a 300-page transcript. Among other revelations, General Milley ordered his staff to preserve what he called boatloads of documents about the January 6 attack for future investigations. And General Milley told Congress there were indications Trump was contemplating issuing unlawful orders to the military. A European regulator has ruled Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, illegally forced users to accept personalized ads. Meta is appealing Wednesday's ruling, which ordered the social media giant to pay $414 million in fines and to allow customers to opt out of so-called behavioral ads. Meanwhile, Twitter said Wednesday it will once again allow political advertisements after former CEO Jack Dorsey banned all political ads on Twitter worldwide in 2019. This comes as Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, struggles to retain advertisers, and after Twitter recently relaxed its COVID-19 misinformation policy and restored the accounts of thousands of banned users. Amazon CEO has announced plans to cut more than 18,000 jobs. They're the largest layoffs in Amazon's history, representing some 6 percent of the retail giant's 300,000 workers. Meanwhile, Salesforce announced plans to lay off 10 percent of its workforce. U.S. tech companies cut more than 150,000 jobs in 2022. President Biden said he'll visit the U.S.-Mexico border next week as part of his upcoming trip to Mexico. It will be Biden's first visit to the border since taking office and comes amidst mounting fallout from the extension of the Trump era Title 42 by the Supreme Court as Republicans challenge the policy, which has been used to expel over 2 million people at the border since March 2020. Biden is expected to focus on 
securing the U.S. southern border, leading to fears of further militarization and abuses against asylum seekers. Thousands of migrants have sought asylum in Mexico in recent weeks over fears the U.S. would keep Title 42 in place. This is an asylum seeker from Honduras. Some of us came here pregnant, since the Honduran economy cannot support our needs. What we want is asylum in the United States, and to go to a shelter that can support us, so that our family in the U.S. can help us with the little that they have. In other immigration news, Canada added a record 431,000 new permanent residents last year. Immigrant residents make up nearly all of Canada's labor force growth. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government is seeking to add half a million new permanent residents in 2025. President Biden met with the family of hospitalized NFL player Damar Hamlin in Cincinnati Wednesday, after the Buffalo Bills star suffered a cardiac arrest on the field during a game Monday. Hamlin remains in critical condition in an ICU at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. On Wednesday, Biden was asked by a reporter if the NFL was getting too dangerous. I don't know how you avoid it. I, don't, I think working like hell on the helmets and the concussion protocols, that all makes a lot of sense. But it's, uh, you know, it is, it is dangerous. We've got to just acknowledge it. A federal judge in Boston has sentenced the mastermind of a college admission scam to three and a half years in prison over a scheme where wealthy parents paid exorbitant bribes to secure spots for their unqualified children in prestigious universities. In some cases, photos were staged or doctored to make the teenagers seem like accomplished athletes. William Rick Singer received the sentence Wednesday, nearly three years after he pleaded guilty to criminal charges, including racketeering, money laundering and obstruction of justice. Singer's clients included Hollywood stars Felicity Huffman and Lori Laughlin and Bill McGlashan, uh, founder of TPG Capital, one of the largest private equity investment firms in the world. Here in New York, thousands of Uber drivers are on a 24-hour strike today. They're demanding the ride-hailing corporation drop its lawsuit aimed at stopping a pay raise approved by the Taxi and Limousine Commission. The New York Taxi Workers Alliance says drivers were cheated out of $12 million in pay in late December after Uber refused to implement pay raises that were supposed to go into effect. And in other news from New York, the NYPD is facing new backlash after officers escorted members of the far-right Proud Board Boys to a subway station, apparently helping them evade their fares after they sought to disrupt a drag story hour, a popular reading event for children at a Queens library in late 2022. Proud boys don't have to pay for the fare. No, Proud special. boys don't have to pay, pay for the we're fare. special, thank you. You don't have to pay for the fare. Appreciate it from your tax. Proud boys don't have to pay for the fare. Oh, thank you. That is thank insane. You. Proud boys don't have to pay for the fare. $3. So, I just need you to go out. Oh, I have to pay for the fare, but they don't? Right. Is that the situation you're saying? That's correct. New York City authorities have been cracking down on fare evasion, flooding subway stations with police, and leading to assaults on passengers and arrests. In related news, a police officer has been suspended after a video emerged of him beating a teenage girl near a Staten Island middle school Tuesday. Police say the attack occurred after two officers attempted to break up a fight among a group of girls. On Wednesday, New York Mayor Eric Adams, himself a former police captain, said he was not pleased with what he saw in the video. But Mayor Adams claimed New Yorkers continue to trust the police. I don't care who you are. You could be the staunchest critic of a police officer, uh, but uh, you know three numbers in this city, 911, and you're happy when they pull up. Uh, you are happy to see them late at night. You're happy if your child is out somewhere knowing that they're on the, on the street. These incidents are not going to erode the relationship that the people of the city have with their, the men and women of the New York City Police Department. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Coming up, the U.N. Security Council is planning to hold an emergency meeting on Israel just days after the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's new far-right government took power. We'll go to Ramallah and Tel Aviv, and then we'll look at what's happening in the U.S. House of Representatives. Stay with us. <laughs> أمرت بشتاق لحالي أمرت بشتاق
Sometimes by Rasha Nahas, a Palestinian musician. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, the United Nations Security Council is preparing to hold an emergency meeting to discuss the recent visit by Israel's new national security minister, Itamar Ben Gavir, to the Al Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem. His visit was condemned across the Middle East. The Palestinian foreign ministry called his visit an unprecedented provocation. The militant group Hamas warned Ben Gavir's actions could lead to more conflict. Jordan has summoned Israel's ambassador to protest the visit, with Jordan's foreign ministry decrying it as scandalous and an unacceptable violation of international law. Al-Aqsa Mosque is one of the holiest sites in Islam. It's also one of the holiest sites in Judaism. Temple Mount was the site of a Jewish temple destroyed by the Romans 2,000 years ago. On Wednesday, Palestine's ambassador to the United Nations, Riyad Mansour, condemned Itamar Ben Gavir's visit. The attack is not only against our holy sites in Al-Aqsa Mosque and in Haram Sharif. There are, because of this environment of extremism, that this Israeli extreme government, the extremist in the history of Israel, is providing, is leading to additional aggression against our Christian sites, Christian graveyards. You've seen by now that there are crosses over, you know, graveyards being trampled upon and attacked by extreme settlers. This is a toxic environment. The international community has to speak with one voice in rejecting this extremism, in rejecting those terrorists and those elements of fascists in the Israeli government. Itamar Ben-Gavir's visit to the Al-Aqsa Mosque came just days after he was sworn in as part of Benjamin Netanyahu's new far-right government, which includes ultra-nationalist and ultra-Orthodox parties that are calling openly for the annexation of the West Bank. Netanyahu's selection of Itamar Ben-Gavir as his national security minister has sparked widespread condemnation. In 2007, Ben Gavir was convicted of incitement to racism and supporting a terrorist organization. Ben Gavir lives in an illegal settlement in the occupied West Bank. In 2021, he relocated his parliamentary office to the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem, where settlers have attempted to violently evict Palestinian residents from their homes. For years, Ben Gavir hung a picture in his home of Baruch Goldstein, an Israeli American who killed 29 Palestinians at a mosque in Hebron in 1994. The Jerusalem Post's editor-in-chief described Ben Gavir as, quote, the modern Israeli version of an American white supremacist and a European fascist, unquote. Ben Gavir will now be responsible for border police in the occupied West Bank at a time when violence and the killing of Palestinians has been surging. To talk more about Itamar Ben Gavir's visit to the Al Aqsa Mosque and Israel's new far right government, considered the most far right government in Israel's history, we're joined by two guests. In Tel Aviv, Gidon Levy is with us, an award-winning Israeli journalist and author columnist for the newspaper Haaretz, member of its editorial board. He's also the author of the book The Punishment of Gaza. 
And in Ramallah, we're joined by Diana Butu. She is a Palestinian lawyer and former advisor to the negotiating team of the Palestine Liberation Organization, also a fellow at Democracy for the Arab World Now, or DAWN. Her latest piece is an op-ed in The New York Times, headlined, Israelis have put Benjamin Netanyahu back in power. Palestinians will surely pay the price. Um, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Diana Butu, let's begin with you. Let's start start with this latest action, considered an incitement by so many, both Palestinians and Israelis, not to mention the rest of the Middle East. Talk about who Itmar ben Gavir is. I mean, he wasn't just charged with um, uh, incitement of racism against Arabs. He was convicted of it and supporting a terrorist organization. Yes, Itamar ben Kvir is he's a disciple, he's a follower of Rabbi Meir Kahane, who is a man who believed that Palestinians should be ethnically cleansed from their homeland. And Itamar ben Kvir has espoused the exact same views as Meir Kahane and continues to espouse these same views. Um, he's talked very openly about his support for Baruch Goldstein. And his visit, his latest visit to the Al Aqsa Mosque camp compound, is not just a visit, it's an attempt to show that there will forever ever be Israeli sovereignty on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and he's trying to uh, incite violence. Not only is he trying to incite violence, he has long believed that the Al-Aqsa Mosque should be, should be, should disappear, and in its place, the Temple Mount be recreated. So his policies have always been that of inciting to violence, inciting to hatred. And although he was only convicted once, he has been indicted more than 50 times. The fact that he is a allowed to be a minister in this government just shows how much it is that the international community is allowing fascism to reign and that they're effectively doing nothing. All that we have heard since this visit and since he's become minister is that the world supports the status quo, but it is that status quo that has led to people like uh, Itamar ben being able to become minister and their actions being normalized. I fear that what he intends to do is to create more and more and more violence as a pretext to once and for all, as he put it, uh, showing Palestinians who the masters of the house are. Those are his words, not mine. Gideon Levy, could you also respond to uh, Ben Gavir's appointment as national security minister, and in particular, his appointment to this uh, post? Benjamin Netanyahu uh, had to uh, create a government. He had, he is leading the biggest uh, party, and uh, he decided this time to go with the most extreme right wingers. The problem is not this. The question is why those right wingers are so popular in Israel. Mm -hmm. And here we face a reality which is well known for a long time: the Israeli society is a very right wing, nationalistic, and part of it, racist society. We have to face this. That's the main problem, not if Ben Gvir is a minister or is not. The problem is, who are we facing when we speak about Israel? And in many ways, I see also a positive side to the results of the last elections by tearing all the masks. Now we see reality. Now it's not the umbrella of the Zionist left to speak so nicely and does almost the same like the right-wingers. Now we face the extreme racism in its most pure expression. Those people don't deny the racism. Those people say very clearly that the Jewish supremacy means that only Jews have rights in this land. And I hope that both some parts of Israeli society and above all the international community will finally draw the conclusions. So, Gideon Levy, that's exactly right, that these far-right parties have received this kind of support, uh, almost 11 percent in this election, but that's much higher than in the past. So could you explain why you think uh, these far-right, hardline extremist parties are more popular now in Israel than they've been in the past? It's almost inevitable. If you continue with the occupation, supported 
by the Zionist left, not only supported, led by the Zionist left. And if this reality of an apartheid state continues, it calls for extremism. It calls for telling the truth. It's call, it calls for telling, for tearing the mask and saying, we aim to be an apartheid state. The occupation is not temporary. The occupation is here to stay. And if it is here to stay, it means we are an apartheid state and we are even not ashamed of it. After 56 years of occupation, you can't expect anything but this radical movement, while the Zionist left never tried to separate itself from the occupation, never tried seriously to put an end to it. So if there is no other force in the Israeli power, let's go for the extreme. This makes a lot of sense. Diana, could you... So talk about that, the uh, shift in Israeli, uh, in the Israeli polity further to the right and the role indeed the left has played. You wrote a recent piece headlined, Israel's so-called left has aided the far right's rise. Yes, uh, Gideon is exactly right. Look, the, there's been a so-called left inside Israel for quite some time. But this so-called left is, I say so-called because that's exactly what it is, so-called. They self-proclaim as uh, left-wing, but this is a left-wing that has never stood up against the occupation. It's a left-wing that has supported the various attacks on the Gaza Strip. It's a left-wing that has supported the siege and blockade on the Gaza Strip. It's a left-wing that has supported the enactment of racist legislation, even in the past couple of years. And so when you're an Israeli voter who sees that the options are between uh, this so-called left wing, which has supported the exact same things as, as the right wing has, then of course it's natural that they're going to vote for this fascist right. The big problem has been that we've never seen that Israelis have paid a price for their electoral choices. It's always been that Palestinians pay the price. And with this, with this new government, it's going to be Palestinians once again, but even more than in the past. Unlike previous Israeli governments where there were other issues that they may have been focused on, this current government, this new government, is myopically and only focused on making life miserable for Palestinians. They don't have any other political platform other than to try to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. This is why we've seen since the beginning of this year that Israel has killed at least one Palestinian per day. And this is why we're seeing the plans to uh, completely ethnically cleanse the Palestinian town of Musafar Yatta. It's because this government has put in its, in its crosshairs Palestinians. And given that there's nobody in the international community that's stopping them, it's going to continue full steam ahead. So let me ask you about Masafer uh, near Hebron in the occupied West Bank, the southern part. Israel's military has begun demolishing homes, water supplies, olive orchards. This week, Israeli armored vehicles accompanied demolition crews as they raised homes and farms in two villages. Last year, the Israeli High Court of Justice approving the home de demolitions, which will uproot more than a thousand people, uh, leading to the U.S. Congress member, who happens to be Palestinian American, Rashida Tlaib, uh, tweeting, not even one week in 2023, new far right apartheid government is moving to ethnically cleanse entire communities, which would displace more than a thousand Palestinian residents, including 500 children, all with American backing, bulldozers, and bullets. Talk about um, the U.S. support at this point for Israel. Israel. You have President Biden congratulating Netanyahu on his return to power, saying he looks forward to working with um, an old friend for decades, adding, the United States will continue to support the two-state solution and to oppose policies that endanger its viability or contradict our mutual interests and values. Um, can you talk about what you feel, and I'd also like to Giddens' response to this, uh, the U.S. should be doing now? Look, 
the U.S. is way behind in the times, and if they still think that there's something left of a two-state solution, then it's only in their dreams that they're, that they're seeing it, because we certainly don't see it on the ground. Instead, what we have seen is that Israel has been allowed to do whatever it wants when it comes to uh, killing Palestinians, when it comes to stealing Palestinian land, when it comes to ethnic cleansing, when it comes to crossing the red lines that are enshrined in international law. Israel's allowed to get away with it, and not only get away with it, but continues to receive support and and uh, and financial support from the United States as well. This isn't just a question of statements, but they're also getting financial support from the United States. And what, as we look around the world and we ask ourselves, we're now in the year 2023, and they're still talking about a two-state solution, a two-state solution that died more than two decades ago, and yet they've done absolutely nothing on the ground to make sure that two-state solution comes to fruition. Instead, all that they have done is to facilitate Israel's process of slowly ethnically cleansing Palestinians. One of the new members of this of this new government is a man named uh, Smotrich, who came out just uh, last year in 2021 and said that the only reason that Palestinians, who are citizens of Israel like me, are still allowed to exist is because the job wasn't finished in, 20, in, in 1948 thereby basically telling us that our time here is short. What the U.S. has instead done is instead of giving them a red light and scaling back and decolonizing and pushing for Israel to end its occupation, end its apartheid, it's pretty much served as a mask for Israel to continue to do whatever it wants to do. And this is why we're in this situation now. It's we've seen that the world is doing nothing. We see that the Israelis, as a result, uh, don't have to pay a price. And so, once again, it's going to be Palestinians that pay the price for Israel's electoral choices. And Gideon Levy, if you can respond, also talk about what you're writing in Haaretz, a very well-respected Israeli newspaper on whose board you serve, and the response of the Israeli population, for example, uh, to these demolitions. Let's face reality. The United States is supporting the apartheid system, is very interested in continuing the occupation and has no interest in human rights uh, of the Palestinians. There's no other way to describe the American position throughout decades. Because would it be different? Would the United States seriously mean to put an end to the occupation? The occupation could have come to its end years ago, if not decades ago. So it's all about a hollow lip service that the United States is paying from time to time, all kind of hollow condemnations. By the end of the day, Israel, this apartheid state, is the closest ally of, of the United States. The money of the taxpayers of the United States go to Israel more than to any other country in the world. And this means that the United States is in favor of an apartheid state. Nothing else by, but this. As about your second question, the, the question about uh, the Israeli reaction to what's going on in Mesafa Yatta can be asked only, and Amy, I highly appreciate you, but can be asked only in the United States, not in Israel. Because in Israel, nobody cares and nobody heard about Mesafa Yatta. Mesafa Yatta is well known maybe to the readership of Haaretz, not all of it, maybe to a small devoted left camp, which is still active. But most of the Israelis not only couldn't care less, they never heard about it. And if they will hear about it, they will just yawn in your face, because finally they all buy the, the, the official propaganda, namely Israel is doing it against terror, Israel has to, to protect itself, and all those old uh, slogans of lies and lies and lies. And Gideon, could you outline what you expect the uh, policies that this new government will initiate, from uh, substantive changes to the judiciary, as well as restrictions on civil liberties within Israel itself, and, of course, what we said in our introduction, uh, the steps towards the uh, annexation of the West Bank? 
As we talk now, the Supreme Court of Israel is dealing with some of their first actions, and the Supreme Court will try to stop them, but the Supreme Court by itself will be a subject of, of, of attacks by this new government, who is going to limit the legal system very much and very quickly. It's really admirable to see how fast they act while the Zionist left had one and a half year being in power and did nothing. They are not yet one week in power and they are already running with their initiatives. Now, a, a, about annexation, I can tell you, but that's my obviously private view, I really hope they will annexate the, the, at least part of the West Bank, if not all of the West Bank. The West Bank was annexated 55 years ago. The West Bank is practically annexed to Israel. Israelis live in the, in the West Bank and, and, and behave in the West Bank as if it's part of Israel, and it is part of Israel. Now, once Israel will declare it officially and legally, then it will be really a question, because then the apartheid state is declared. You understand that if Israel annexates the West Bank without giving full civil rights and national rights to the Palestinians, which nobody in this government or in any other government means to give, once this is happening, Israel declares itself an apartheid state. And then I would like to see how Washington and the EU and some others will react to a, an official declaration of apartheid. Will they treat it like the first apartheid state, namely South Africa? Or will they continue to hug Israel as a darling of the West, even though it's a declared apartheid state? So let's challenge the world. Diana, could you respond to uh, the points that, that Gideon has made? And also, uh, you've written a great deal in your recent articles both about settler violence against Palestinians and uh, Israeli securities, uh, security forces' complicity in that violence. Uh, if you could elaborate on that and, and respond to, to what Gideon uh, said about uh, apartheid. Look, it's already an apartheid state, and I don't need for Israel to declare it to be an apartheid state. They already know it's an apartheid state. My fear is always, what is it that's going to happen to people on the ground? And whether Israel annexes or whether they don't annex, the result for Palestinians is the same, that Israel is continuing this process of land theft. It's kicking people off their land. It's turning uh, Palestinians into, into people who are homeless. And it's killing them as well. This has long been its, its process, long been its system. Now, it's not just the Israeli state that does it. It's not just the army, but it's also Israeli settlers. We've already seen that in all of these years, with all of these attacks that have been conducted by Israeli settlers against Palestinians, that rarely, if ever, is an Israeli settler ever prosecuted for their crimes. They're rarely even charged for their crimes, much less uh, see the full, full conviction. And this is because the, Israel has turned a blind eye towards violence that it perpetrates against Palestinians. But again, I don't expect anything differently from the Israeli state nor do I expect anything differently from Israeli settlers. That is their raison d'etre. That is their reason for being. What I would have expected is that somehow the world community would have stood, for, stood up and would have done something differently and begin to hold Israel accountable for its actions. It would have held the Israeli uh, state, its soldiers, and so on. And instead, we don't see it. For example, just this, just this past year, uh, a Palestinian American journalist, Shirin Abu Akli, was also a friend, was murdered um, by Israel, by Israeli forces. Her death was probably the most investigated death that I've ever seen in all of my years of living here in Palestine. From everything from uh, outlets from CNN to AP to the New York Times to, to, uh, to NGOs and so on. And yet to this current day, we still don't see that anybody has been held to account, even though we know that it was an Israeli soldier who shot and killed her. And so this is what it means to be living as a Palestinian 
Palestinian is that you're always living in this space where your life means absolutely nothing and that your life can be extinguished at any moment, whether that, that happens at the hands of an Israeli soldier, whether it happens at the hands of an Israeli settler, or whether your land and your homes are, are demolished by the Israeli government. That's what it means to be living as a Palestinian. And I want to encourage people to go to our website at democracynow.org, uh, where we interviewed a Democracy Now! correspondent, uh, Sharif Abdel Kudus, who did a documentary for Al Jazeera called The Killing of Shireen Abu Akhla. And we also interviewed Shireen's niece, uh, Lina. Uh, Diana Butu, we want to thank you so much for being with us, Palestinian lawyer, former advisor to the negotiating team of the Palestine Liberation Organization. We'll link to your piece in The New York Times. Israelis have put Benjamin Netanyahu who back in power, Palestinians will surely pay the price. And Gideon Levy, uh, Israeli journalist in Tel Aviv, columnist for the newspaper Haaretz, a member of its editorial board. Coming up, well, the House of Representatives isn't right now, because without a House speaker, no Congress member can be sworn in. We'll look at the far-right Republicans continuing to block Kevin McCarthy's attempts to become speaker, and did he, in a sense, open the door by supporting the pro-insurrectionist Congress members? Six rounds of voting against him so far. How long will the standstill last? Stay with us. by the selector. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Congressional chaos. Yes, we go now to Capitol Hill, where the House of Representatives remains without a House speaker, following a rebellion by far-right Republicans who've blocked Republican leader Kevin McCarthy's attempts to become speaker. On Wednesday, the House held three more rounds of votes, and in each one, McCarthy failed to win the needed 218 votes to become speaker, even though Republicans hold a slim majority in the House. Until a speaker is elected, the House cannot perform any other actions. In fact, members of the new Congress, all of them, more than 400 of them, haven't even been sworn in yet. In the fifth and sixth rounds of voting, 20 Republicans backed Byron Donalds of Florida over McCarthy. The leader of the Democrats in the House, Hakeem Jeffries, has so far received the most votes in each round as the entire Democratic caucus supports him. That the total number of votes cast is 433, of which the Honorable Hakeem Jeffries of the state of New York has received 212. The Honorable Kevin McCarthy of the state of California has received 201. The Honorable Byron Donalds of the state of Florida has received 20. With one recorded as present. No member elect having received a majority of the votes cast, a speaker has not been elected. 
In a moment, we'll go to Capitol Hill to speak with Representative-elect Greg Kassar of Texas, who's still waiting to be sworn in. On Wednesday, he appeared on a live Instagram video with New York Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Hey, everybody! What's up? How's it going? We got Greg Kassar here. We got the Capitol in the background. We're just kind of sitting here, because— I was supposed to become a member of Congress yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting. Poor Greg. He was supposed to be sworn in for the first time yesterday. I was supposed to be sworn in for, I can't even believe it, the third time. Third time. My God. And they make them different. They give us these yes. green. Now we've got Green New Deal pins. We've got, I know. I, I put in a call. I said everyone's getting a Green New Deal pin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just did it because, yeah. according to the far right. She runs um, the place. According to the far right, the, the left flank of the party runs, if only, right? We would have okay. Medicare for all by now. That was the truth. Um, but. Just wanted to say hey to everybody because we're just sitting here and it's just a total mess right now. There's still no Speaker of the House. We're now what? I keep, I keep thinking that somebody's going to tell me what's going to happen, right? There's like hundreds of members of Congress. I'm like, so what's happening next? They're like, we don't know. We don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. We have no idea. <laughs> this is how the government is run. So so that is Democratic Congress member elect Greg Kassar, as well as uh, uh, Alexandria Casio Cortez on an Instagram feed. Uh, but right now, um, the Congress member elect Kassar is joining us from the Cannon Rotunda. He's a former labor organizer and Austin City Council member. Also with us, Ryan Grimm, D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept. Uh, so, Greg Kassar, this has been quite an initiation for you. I mean, in in fact, in a way, the House of Representatives does not exist right now, because you need to have a House speaker before any one of the more than 400 Congress members are sworn in. Talk about your view from right there, um, as you sit there, what's taking place. Explain to us what you understand is happening with McCarthy and his right flank. Now, good morning. In some ways, it's flabbergasting, as you saw with my conversation with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. But on the other hand, it's not that surprising. There were so many members who have been here for decades who said this hadn't happened in a century. But my feeling is that we should have seen this coming because Kevin McCarthy and the Republican, the top Republicans in the House have essentially been putting gas in the tank of this kind of Republican extremism and division for so long uh, that, of course, this isn't just a tactic. This is part of their goal. They don't want a functioning federal government that can pass legislation and support working people. They want to continue to drag us further and further to the right or even just not even have a Congress in the first place. And Greg, could you explain who are the hardline far right conservatives who are uh, holding up uh, the uh, selection of a House speaker, the election of a House speaker? You have uh, essentially the most Trump part of the Republican Party, uh, some real true believers in what I believe is an author more authoritarian, much more strongly authoritarian form of government. And what they want to do is essentially uh, change the rules of the House uh, in their favor so that they can push the Republican Party further and further to the right. They're making arguments about how they want a more democratic process, but ultimately it seems to be a process that they want to have more power uh, for themselves to continue to drag the government to the right. And uh, Kevin McCarthy, to them, uh, is essentially too much of a liberal, uh, even though he is ultimately of the extreme right of this country and, and frankly, uh, of the extreme right for a politician in the world. Uh, and so it really is quite a thing to see as they continue to embrace authoritarianism and division. We try to stay united and are trying to build a positive uh, vision for the country and, and try to show folks that we're going to hopefully be interested in governing if we take back the House here in just two years. Is it true that the Democrats are eating popcorn watching this show? I wish I knew where the popcorn <laughs> stands were. Um, but, you know, apart from uh, the fact that we could laugh some about them sort of being eaten alive by the monster they created, on the other hand, it is terrifying. We don't have a United States Congress. And despite the, how the media does show accurately that there's division there, we also hear in their speeches a lot of unity around moving the country further to the right, whether the, you're a McCarthy person or a never McCarthy Republican. They continue to give speeches about the border, vilify, vilifying uh, asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants and poor black and brown people. So in many ways, they really are unified around this platform 
uh, and that is actually really a scary thing for the country. And let me ask you, as you were there with AOC, there is a lot of criticism of the that the squad has and other progressives of Hakeem Jeffries, but you all have been unified uh, in voting for him as House Speaker. Um, again, uh, he is the first uh, black lawmaker to be uh, voted uh, House Speaker nominee. But the significance of this, and do you share their criticism, but obviously you voted for him as well? That's correct. I believe, as a longtime labor organizer and somebody that has worked on a body where I was the most progressive member, but there were other Democrats and then Republicans on that body when I was on city council, I believe that you need to use your leverage to continue to negotiate and get the best deal that you can get. And I believe that will be uh, the work that we're tasked with doing with Speaker Jeffries. He's a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Uh, I agree with him on many issues. There are some issues where I believe that we need to get uh, more progressive legislation and more progressive action out of Democratic leadership. That's part of the job, is for us to each play our role on the team and recognize that we need to have leverage on the left. For example, uh, we've been working uh, for months pushing and asking the White House to help us get abortion access in Texas via the U.S. Postal Service. And now, just two days ago, the Department of Justice finally released an opinion that clears the path for people in blue states to mail abortion pills to places like Texas. And again, that, you know, President Biden did not run on a hardcore progressive platform, but I believe that by continuing doing our organizing work, building public pressure uh, and creating alliances, we can get important work done, whether there is a house for the next few days or not. And Ryan Graham, you've been there reporting on these extraordinary events. If you could talk about your response to what's been happening and these Republicans who are holding things up, these far-right uh, Republican extremists. I think the piece that the media has been missing so far is the substance of, of the fight that's being waged right now. And it's really about social spending and particularly about Social Security, about Medicare, Medicaid, and the, and the Affordable Care Act. You know, yesterday, Ralph Norman, who's a Freedom Caucus member from South Carolina, you know, told reporters in the hallway that the thing that Kevin McCarthy needs to agree to to win their support, it's, that it's non-negotiable, is that he needs to be willing to shut the government down rather than raise the debt ceiling. You know, that's a rather frightening statement on a number of levels. On, on the top level, it's frightening because it's a complete misunderstanding of how government works. There's actually not a relationship between a government shutdown and hitting the debt ceiling. And one reporter immediately said to him, you mean going into default? And he said, well, you wouldn't go into default if you start planning now to stop spending money you know, among various agencies. And so we could avoid that. But that's, that's a complete fantasy. There is, there is no, there is no path uh, that gets you out of, you know, that you'd have to, you know, it's, it's just, it's just simply uh, incredible that he would suggest something like that. The only, the only kind of remedy it seems like at this point that the executive has is to say, look, the debt ceiling is not actually constitutional. Congress has appropriated money. It's the executive's job to spend that money. And we're, we're just, we're, we're just not going to pay attention to the debt ceiling anymore. And then I guess you would punt it over to the Supreme Court and you would dare the Supreme Court to put the country into, into global default, which I don't think that they would do because that would undermine their, their real mission, you know, the mission that the Roberts Court is on. So I think that that's the thing that people are missing is that this is all setting up for some titanic fight this summer uh, over the debt ceiling. And Ryan Grimm, how do you see the stalemate uh, ending? You know, I, I wish I could tell you, I, I feel like a fraud up here. I've been covering Congress for 15, 16 years or whatever now. And, and uh, like, like uh, Congressman-elect uh, Kassar was saying, nobody really knows. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the right is feeling their oats right now. Like, if, if, you know, talking to sources on the right, they're like, look, McCar they're like, look McCarthy is toast. You know, he, he, had, he had a long time, you know, to work with these members to, to win their support. Uh, he didn't. Uh, they're all trashing him, saying he doesn't trust them. Uh, his allies are all calling them narcissists. You had Ken Buck say that you know maybe they need we need, just need to give Steve Scalise a shot to work a deal out, which was a really brutal kind of blow uh, for for McCarthy. On the other hand, you have a bunch of McCarthy supporters saying we're not doing that. We're we're pu we're pu we're pushing forward, and so it, it, there was a deal cut last night. Uh, where Kevin McCarthy agreed that the House Republican Super PAC would not go after 
far right Republicans in open red seats, which is you know something I think the squad probably should have pushed for in in 2019 and 2021 to say, hey, if you want our support, then the DCCC and the House Super PAC have to stop kind of putting their thumb on the scale in Democratic primaries. That was a, that was a good idea from them. But will that be enough uh, for them to go over and support McCarthy? Nobody really knows. Explain that further, what this super PAC is all about. And then, apparently, overnight, um, he has agreed to allow just one Congress member to can put forward a motion to remove the House Speaker. Um, I think he had agreed to five before, now right. one, and then the House would vote on it, uh, to say the least, right. holding a right. gun and to I, his head. Yeah, and I always thought that that was kind of a silly demand, because if you're going to get rid of the Speaker, you're going to need five votes anyway. So what's, what's the big deal about needing— one person putting forward a motion to vacate uh, the, the speaker's chair versus you needing five signatures to vacate it. But OK, so now McCarthy has even given in to lowering the threshold from five down to one. That would only produce a vote that wouldn't vacate the chair. Uh, but presumably, if somebody's going to put that forward, they they would ha they would have the votes at that point. The Congressional Leadership Fund is the is basically kind of the House Republicans super PAC. And McCarthy was using it to go after you know some of these far right Republicans. Just the same way that the the DCCC and the House Super PAC had gone after some kind of justice Democrats or or squad aligned Democrats o over the years, and so what the far right was able to extract from him here in in the negotiations with Club for Growth, which the left doesn't have, that's a you know billionaire funded kind of super PAC, uh, saying that look, okay, we will let these primaries play out, uh, and and we're not gonna we're not gonna get involved with those. Um, I wanted to ask Greg Kassar, as we talked about divisions even within the Democratic Party, about President Biden announcing he's going to visit the U.S.-Mexico border next week as part of his trip to Mexico next week. It'll be his first visit to the border since taking office. I mean, the images on the border, both sides, Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, of people freezing under blankets, um, Title 42, the Biden administration has kind of wanted to remove the pandemic policy that has prevented millions from applying for political asylum uh, in the United States, um, still is in place because of the Supreme Court. What do you want to see happen this next week? And will you be going to the border with him? I hope that I'm uh, installed as a member of Congress and that we get to get out of D.C. and get back to Texas to work with my constituents in my district and, uh, and on the border. I believe that it's really important for the president to be there and for the truth to be spoken about what's going on at the border, because so much of the fear mongering, um, it, we heard on the House floor yesterday that these are criminals. It's like when President Trump came down the escalator and said they're rapists. But really, we're talking about asylum seekers, refugees, moms and their kids uh, that are in dire need. I know that our country and our economy will be so much stronger and that we're all better off when immigrants are welcomed into this country and supported. The federal government should provide the support necessary to the relatively small overall number of people uh, that have been displaced um, and that are hungry, that are coming here to make our country and everybody's lives here better off. That's what makes Texas a great place in the first place. And I think the president being there, uh, I think it will give him the stories he needs uh, to tell the true story. I think it can touch our hearts and help us do the right thing. Um, finally, uh, Ryan Grimm, uh, can you tell us who uh, Byron Donalds is, uh, the African-American um, uh, Republican Congress member who 20 Republicans have voted for, the first time an African-American and both the Democratic and Republican Party has been nominated to be House Speaker? Fair, fairly new member of Congress, uh, far-right member of the Freedom Caucus. And like like you said, the Re Republicans were extremely proud uh, to eventually move their support to him. They started with a, num a number of others, like uh, Jim Jim Jordan and others. Uh, one of the one of the one of the Republicans, when they got up, uh, basically gave a speech about Frederick Douglass, telling reminding the Democrats uh, that Frederick Douglass was a Republican and how Douglass said he would always and only ever be a Republican. 
uh, and and then from there uh, not nominated uh, you know uh, uh, Byron. So uh, it, it's we it's kind seconds. of a play that they're making on identity politics. And of course, we'll continue to cover this. Ryan Grimm, D.C. bureau chief for the Intercept and Democratic Congress member elect Greg Kassar of Texas. Happy birthday to Claudia Vara and belated happy birthday to Dennis McCormick. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh.